Welcome to Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I'm the editor-in-chief of Current Affairs magazine. I am joined today by Professor Jennifer Jacquet. She is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at New York University and the author of The Playbook, How to Deny Science, Sell Lies, and Make a Killing in the Corporate World, a very useful guidebook. Professor Jacquet, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, your book is probably the first book I've interviewed anyone about on this program that is written almost entirely in sarcasm. <laughs> so perhaps we could start by explaining the premise of the playbook. So the playbook was written by my alter ego, who runs a consulting company called JJ and Friends. And uh, we work on behalf of our clients to help them understand how to both deny science and also use science to their advantage. You know, a good accountant doesn't allow a new tax code to ruin its clients, right? We're doing the same for science here at JJ and Friends. So yeah, the <laughs> book is written in a sarcastic way for a whole bunch of different reasons. Mm. And I felt that looking at it from that side, I also taught at the Stern School of Business for a long time at NYU, looking at it through that angle would actually give me some kind of advantage. And I think it did. It, it helped me sort of predict certain tactics that I was able to outline. So your book kind of starts from, from the perspective, you know, I guess, if I was a consultant and I accepted the Milton Friedman premise that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits and nothing more, and that there is a fiduciary duty to put the pursuit of profit above all else, what then would be the various implications that flow from that in terms of how a corporation was obligated to and ought to approach uh, scientific research that threatened it? Yeah, exactly. Or just scientific knowledge in general. So the book is really an homage to scientific knowledge because when you think about the various competing forms of knowledge that we could be using, we're fortunate to live, I think, in the modern moment, which is very heavily grounded in science. Just a wonderful way of knowing the world that's more open to a kind of democratic approach to forming knowledge than any other system. And most businesses, of course, are very pro-science. They use science to their advantage. We just lived through, you know, a global pandemic. We know that Pfizer and Moderna used science, right, to help us come create these vaccines and maybe sort of faith that we would not all die from COVID-19, et cetera. But there are moments, of course, when scientific knowledge threatens business operations. You know, the science of climate change is very much one of those moments for fossil fuel companies where they confront, they have these internal scientists, they also have the external scientific knowledge. They confront the problem of climate change and they decide the writing is on the wall for them, right? I mean, this is really going to undermine their business, full stop. And so they have some options at that juncture. Yeah. And their Milton Friedman approach was, let's pull the greatest heist on global consciousness that you could possibly imagine and pretend that this is a hoax. And I say pretend because internally they did know that climate change was real. Mm. But as you point out, chapter one is denial a fiduciary duty. And so the structure of the corporation, if it does follow, the Friedman dictum, is uniquely ill-suited to deal with a situation in which facts are emerging that show that the pursuit of that goal, pathologically, if you build an institution around the maximization of profits and it has a certain product and facts emerge that show that that product and that goal will cause terrible human harm, you have this awful conflict of the interests of the artificial institution of the corporation with the interests of everyone else. Yeah, or, or the interests of even this structure form of knowledge, which is why this book is so important, I would say, in the present mm. moment, because we're really talking about 
sort of undermining or threatening this entire way of knowing the world. Now, keep in mind, every company, I think, would have that impulse that if scientific knowledge is, you know, threatens their business, they'd like to fight it. But not all companies are well suited to do that. We have, though, many examples through history where that's certainly the case. And again, the fossil fuel companies sort of outright denying climate change is probably the biggest and boldest example of that. But it starts in the early 20th century with workers' issues around, you know, medical issues like lead, radium, asbestos, you know, the asbestos companies, they employed their own doctors who were looking at x-rays of the employees, could see that they were developing life-threatening illnesses as a result of handling their products, and directly just lied to their face. And so there's a long history of denying scientific knowledge, in this case, medical knowledge, so that the business can stay afloat. And it hasn't stopped with climate change either. You know, I think what this book does is point out When scientific knowledge threatens the business, they will respond in very predictable ways. Mm -hmm. And we need to all sort of be braced for those moments. Yes. I think the value of the book is that you get inside the heads of those who think in terms of, well, how do we neutralize the threat that this research is posing to our profits? So the playbook even though it looks like an amoral playbook for corporations to pursue the campaign of denial, is in fact a playbook for those of us who wish to anticipate what they will do and counter it. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, it is sort of banal at the end of the day. Once you put on that, you know, really try to embrace the mindset of, we need to make money at all costs. We have to stay in the business. We need to corner the market. We have to maintain our market share. It's very easy to see the kind of tactics that fall out of that. Now, mm. luckily, we have some stop gaps that hold us back from going full hog. So in, in many South American countries, scientists have been physically threatened, harassed, chased, for instance, by agrochemical companies mm. in a way that we haven't seen as much of in the United States, although, of course, that that could change. So it's not as if, you know, we don't have some sort of social backstops, but it is pretty easy to predict that we will harass scientists. It's just kind of what form it takes depends on your geopolitical setting. Mm. And those might be part external constraints on corporate activity. That is to say, if the law would and journalism is capable of exposing bad acts, then they can't commit the bad acts that they would commit. I've always been kind of shocked every time I think about what the logical conclusion of the pure pursuit of the Friedmanite, the social responsibility of businesses to increase its profits thing, because it does lead to, if you really accepted that as the sole social responsibility of business, physical violence against scientists would be an obligation, would be a fiduciary obligation, except to the extent that you'd get found out. Like, it's a real sociopathic you max him. <laughs> yeah, as would child labor, as would a seven-day work week. You know, that's what I mean by these sort of social backstops. Like, mm. we do have structures in place that the corporation can't go as far as it might like to. And I think that this book is a call to arms that we need more of them vis-a-vis scientific knowledge. Because mm-hmm. one of the things that really comes across in the playbook is how big the playbook is. I mean, how many different kinds of tactics can be used to sow doubt on and discredit inconvenient facts for the corporation? Well, yeah, and then they kind of refresh every decade or so in the digital space and the digital tools now to create fake messages or advertising, spread it throughout social media. That's just given a whole new, again, set of tools. And I think we have to think long and hard about how to make sure that that truth prevails. So let's map out a little bit of the different kinds of methods that can be used to fight inconvenient scientific knowledge. Yeah, so I argue there are really four broad strategies, and then the kind of specifics fall into each of these bins. And one is to outright challenge the problem that the science has outlined altogether. So the classic and most obvious case of this is the example of climate change. There are almost very few other examples that are as bold and brazen as this. Like the companies that made CFCs did not deny the existence of the ozone layer altogether. 
Instead, they tried to minimize it or argue that a lot of it was natural or these other kind of ideas. And there are various ways that you can sort of play around the edges of of the problem. Yes, the second one, so challenge the problem altogether, challenge causation. This is, I'd say, the bread and butter of what corporations are up to. They want to say, oh, yes, of course, there's a problem with chemicals in the watershed, but that it's not because of us. It's because of this or that. Mm. Of course, there is cancer, but smoking doesn't cause cancer. That's because you already had a, you know, a predilection, a genetic predisposition, addictive personality, all of these other causes. And then there's, so there's challenge the problem, challenge the cause, challenge those individual scientists making the claims or reporters or activists, mm. current affairs, whoever's making these claims, you know, <laughs> put them in the hot seat. And then finally challenge the policies. If you haven't been successful in challenging those three groups, and we come down to a policy discussion that like, maybe we should be taxing carbon. Now you challenge the policies altogether. And you say, you know, we do need to address climate change, but taxing carbon is not the way to go. We should X, Y, Z. And then once taxing carbon becomes politically impossible, then come out and encourage the taxation of carbon. So it's this, Mm. again, this ruse, and it's all in the name of buying time. And that's what these tactics are good for, Mm. is that it engages with something that science takes very seriously as a way of knowing the world, that it's always open to revision. And there are, again, other competing forms of knowledge are not always open to revision, right? Mm. Religious forms of knowledge are very closed off to revision. Science always says, like, we will deal with the pushback seriously. We'll entertain that hypothesis. Nothing is ever case closed. And so the corporations see that as a loophole. That's their offshore tax haven (laughs) for science. And they exploit it over and over again. Yeah. So the thing that makes science strong actually also makes it weak and and vulnerable in a certain way. And that scientists, they want to be cautious about making extremely confident statements. And then a corporation could go, ah, you see, they're not even confident in what they believe. So why should you believe it? Exactly. That is the culture of science. And it all, it's the way of doing science. It can take decades or even centuries to reach consensus on positions. And it's a beautiful thing. But in the short run, it makes science very vulnerable. Mm-hmm. You mentioned there that the last one that, that you mentioned was this policy, you know, attacking the policies. And it made me think of I'm a regular reader at the Wall Street Journal op-ed page because I need to keep tabs on what industry is saying. I try not to believe any of it, but it's a good mouthpiece for the it, it really tells you where Wall Street stands on any, any given thing. And I've noticed over time a kind of switch from outright climate change denial to well, but we shouldn't do anything about it. All the proposals for ways to deal with it, they won't work. They're going to um, just eat up taxpayer money or the the problem is real, but it's not so important. It's only going to hit GDP a little bit. So don't do anything. Whatever you do, no matter what you believe, don't do anything. <laughs> yeah, they have that, I mean, sequential tactic down from sort of denying the problem then denying the cause, hurting, of course, the scientists, journalists, and activists. They're still working a lot on that, and eventually litigators, I think, too. And then, again, denying or challenging the policies. And this has bought the fossil fuel companies over 50 years of full-on profits. I mean, if you run the calculations, this was a very good bet on their part. Mm -hmm. And I think we should all be really upset about that, frankly. Right. I think that gambling with the planet, with our future, with our morality in that way really is villainous. Yeah, it's pretty uncomfortable, right? To enrich yourself on the basis of harming other people. (laughs) Yeah, the the simple facts. Defrauding the public by lying to them about the harm that you're doing. A couple of years ago, there was an Exxon lobbyist who was caught on tape admitting that you mentioned just mentioned this the carbon tax thing where they came around on supporting a carbon tax and he said on tape, oh yes, we support a carbon tax because we know it won't happen. We deliberately picked that policy, <laughs> yeah. you know, as part of the strategy to make sure that there is no policy that gets passed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, we're really talking about the most powerful transnational corporations in the world, and it's hard to even pinpoint individuals within those firms that are, I mean, I have a few in mind, but are tacitly responsible. This is what's so interesting is that culture, that dominant 
Friedman-esque idea of what the corporation is seems to dominate this behavior and allow it to be so predictable. It's really painful. It's painful to see it unfold in this way. And what's even crazier is, you know, when you read a book like Empire of Pain about the Sackler family of Mm. Purdue Pharma, which is privately held, I sort of had this like a nugget of hope that, oh, this company may act a little bit differently because it's not under this publicly traded profit maximization. You know, they could Mm. exactly untrue. I mean, it's just the playbook word for word all over again. It's greed as the way of existing in the world. Yeah, I think one of the important things that your book does is by putting all of the different cases together for very different subjects from uh, drug manufacturers to cigarettes to climate change, you really can see the tendencies much more easily when you've seen something similar in different cases. Like when you go through the history of the tobacco companies, then you really see what the fossil fuel companies are doing much even more clearly. Yeah. And what's interesting is the role of these third party allies or PR firms or stratcoms companies in helping globalize and share these tactics across companies. So they're really the arms dealers, right? Hmm. Exxon doesn't want to share what it does with Chevron, let alone Tyson or Cargill. But the PR firms take these tactics, they sharpen them in these campaigns, and then they just swiftly move them across. I mean, John Hill at Hill and Milton was a genius at doing this. And that's how their side is so well equipped because they're they're hiring these same firms to do their bidding. Mm. You know, some days I think it's an interesting question to think, do people know what they're doing or are they in denial And then some days I think, well, I don't care if they know it or not. The actions are the same. It's of no interest to me what goes on in their mind. The PR people, I kind of understand because I went to law school and lawyers are the same where their, their mindset in terms of justifying it to themselves is, well, my job isn't to think about the substance. I'm just here to help a client. And the the ethics of my profession are you do the best for your client. That's the extent of the ethical inquiry I need to make. But you, as someone who's been in a business school and see the business culture, Do the people within, say, fossil fuel companies or tobacco companies, do they recognize generally the dishonesty of the playbook? Like, do they go like, oh, yes, we know that we're doing harm, but we're going to lie about it? It feels to me like very few people would be able to admit that, that to themselves, honestly. It's very hard to find examples of this. It's even hard to find examples of industry funded scientists within universities who sort of regret the work that they've done. Mm. That's a group of people where I'd expect to find that more often, or I looked for it and was surprised at how little I saw with a few incredible exceptions. But within the companies, I think I cited in the book, it's a good longer interview, but one of the, the managers at Johns Mansville, the asbestos corporation, who eventually went bankrupt because of, of their denial of worker safety, basically. He wrote a long piece in the Harvard Business Review sort of about this culture of denial and how problematic he thought it was. And I thought that was interesting. And I wouldn't say it was super revealing in terms of the psychology, but it was to say that someone there had a pulse Mm. and that, that felt distinct. I mean, it really is hard to see examples of this. You know, there are these masterminds, as much as I said there are clearly a lot of individuals carrying out this work in piecemeal fashion, and they can probably deny it because they're working on this for a few months and then they move on to something else. But then there are people like Lee Raymond, who was the CEO of Exxon during a period in which it really went whole hog into climate denial, who really did seem to have hardcore ideological (laughs) beliefs that would be interesting to sort of get on the record. Mm. What do you mean? In this sense, I feel like there hasn't been enough work into figuring out his psychology. There's been much more, I think, to figure out, you know, the Koch brothers yeah. by Jay Mayer. But Lee Raymond, is a, he's a pretty important figure for what happened with climate denial. And I feel like there's not enough interest in sort of what makes him tick, although perhaps it's as simple as greed. I mean, really, yeah. that's how it appears. It's true. But there's so many efforts to cast greed as something else. You know, Charles Koch wrote a book 
called Good Profit that's about how to do well while doing good and all that. And it's very strange to me that all of the people who are wreaking this destruction for their own benefit still think of themselves as good people doing good for the world. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's one thing that has to change. I mean, there are lots of options that we could go about, you know, trying to figure out how to fix all of this. But one of them is, I think, to delegitimize a lot of these industries. Mm. Of course, it'd be nice to delegitimize the whole model of profit-seeking as the be-all and end-all to existence. And then after that, you know, these extractive industries who really exist to, you know, rape and pillage the earth, there shouldn't be as much prestige to work for them or with them as there is. Right. I mean, you're laughing, but I mean, it really, yes. it's still pretty glamorous, right? <laughs> yes, there should not be glamour in working for the destruction of the world industry. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good place to start. Yeah. I'd like it if weapons companies could be added to the list because they need human conflict to persist. <laughs> Agreed. You know, I wish I had more about weapons manufacturers in the book. I only have a few cases, one in which you know, the NRA sent a a letter directly to a scientist who was doing work on the impact of gun violence in America. But I don't have enough research on them. And I think that's a really great area for exploration. Yeah, because the fact that a lot of weapons company executives also serve in foreign policy think tanks suggests to me that there is a conflict of interest in terms of the whether you produce opinions that are more likely to exacerbate global conflict or resolve it through diplomacy. Well, and I think that they've had an enormous chilling effect on independent research in the United States by people who might be interested in pursuing research into gun violence. I think they are dissuaded by the power of the NRA. Mm. They'll love that I say that, by the way. They'll say, oh, that's a win for us. This is a measurable outcome. Yeah. You've talked about a little bit about the denial, the casting doubt on actual scientific research, but a lot of the playbook discusses the manufacture of fake scientific research or pseudoscience, creating the illusion of this alternate body of knowledge with the appearance of credibility. So it's not so much that it's pseudoscience, but it's about shaping the scientific research Mm. agenda. So the cigarette manufacturers, again, this was John Hill's idea. He, He was so smart and understood sort of the way that science had legitimacy within our society. But he said, okay, I'm going to get all this tobacco money, and I'm going to give it to all these medical doctors and medical researchers who are interested in alternative causation. So that some of that that interest was, I would say, genuinely motivated. You know, they were just sort of like, well, what if something else causes this lung cancer aside from smoking? He'd found all those people that he could, and he gave them lots and lots of money. And not only did this create an illusion that there were all these alternative causation hypotheses. But it also kept those people busy. Mm -hmm. It kept them from looking at smoking. It kept them working on genes or on addictive personalities or on these other questions. And so it has this kind of distraction technique. And again, that's just something that the powerful can do. They can shape the research agenda proactively. And that's something that's harder to to sort of write off as denial. It it really isn't. But it, it is a way that power manifests. That's so interesting because it seems what you're saying is that it doesn't even require there to be dishonest or corrupt scientists who are taking industry money in order to adjust their findings because there are more subtle ways in which even honest scientists can have their honest research misused to sow doubt. Exactly. So I've, I've sort of started thinking this will be in the sequel but of, of scientists or researchers, because that's an interesting category of people to me. But as sort of just like the most benign one would just be your just daily desperate researcher. Like, I just need money. Then there's the sellout, right? Who sort of does the industries. The industry's like, hey, we have this mm-hmm. idea. And the researcher's like, okay, I'll work on it. That's more of like just a sellout. Then there's the industry shill who I think does more than just work on those issues. They also write op-eds saying we shouldn't have a carbon tax or, you know, they're really kind of egregious. They're shaping public conversation. 
And then I would argue there's the full on merchants of doubt, like we'll go to Congress, we'll talk to your mom, we'll go to Germany, you know, whatever it takes. And they're just sort of fully in bed with industry. And so I've kind of been thinking of this as a spectrum lately. Mm-hmm. Just, just scientists need to get a little savvier about politics and <laughs> economics and power. It seems to me like one of the problems here is that many researchers kind of live in their heads and they think that they're working on this isolated problem and, and don't necessarily think very much about, you know, how the research is ultimately used because that's like, Yes. So one area I think that we could do a quick fix is, you know, in order to to do science, the industry needs scientists and they have some options. They can just, you know, get consultants. They have these product defense firms like Gradient. But we all know this is sort of where science goes to die, right? Like it's still kind of work for hire. The university experts, those real university scientists who seem to be completely independent and might be taking grants, they're the kind of bread and butter. And I think they have to become not only much more aware and sort of motivated ethically as individuals, but there have to be rules put in place in universities. Universities are being used so much and so willfully, I should add, by corporations right now. And I think that that kind of credibility that those universities have built up, it's perilous. It's not going to necessarily be there in a hundred years if we keep playing our cards this way. Mm. And I have this line in the book, it's probably my favorite by Thomas Kuhn talking about science, how great it is and how it takes these really special conditions for science to work and that those social conditions may not exist in the future. And that really is the risk here is that we've benefited enormously from this way of knowing, from this form of knowledge. And it really is under threat right now due to private interests. Mm. Because it could be corrupted very easily. And yeah, but maybe you could say a, a little more. You say that uh, corporate influence on the university of corporations using the university. Perhaps you could say how. I mean, I know that the, the Koch brothers have like paid for a bunch of professorships, you know, to teach libertarian economics and all that. In fact, I, as an undergrad, learned from a professor whose official title was the J.P. Morgan Chase Professor of Ethics, which I always found really, really funny. But what are you talking about when you're you're talking about how the corporation uses the university? Yeah, well, this is one of the ways in which the tactics have have heavily evolved. And again, starting really with cigarette manufacturers. So they saw the most prestigious institutions and they bought their way in to Scripps or to, oh, UCSD and all these other. I've been looking a lot at California institutions, but there are others, too. And the oil and gas companies have been at the big Ivy League schools for ages And they buy entire centers sometimes, and they shape and influence those research agendas. There was a big story in the New York Times in the fall about the way that meat and dairy companies have just done this at the University of California, Davis. So meat and dairy companies have been singled out for their role in climate change, especially due to methane, which is a very important and powerful, short-lived, but very powerful greenhouse gas. And so they've launched this multi-million dollar center called Clear It's really a PR hub for the agriculture industry, the animal agriculture industry, and it operates out of UC Davis and it makes it look kind of like a legitimate research institute, but they're not publishing peer-reviewed research. They are publishing blog posts and tweets and a lot of sort of white papers and shaping the conversation, getting, you know, quoted by journalists and of course attributed to UC Davis. And I think this is really dangerous territory. Mm. You know, for the industries who use science, they need scientists. And if we cut off that pipeline and allow them to use scientists who work within the company, I'm not opposed to that. Hire your scientists and they can write their affiliation as Tyson, but not as UC Davis. Yeah. So universities need to be very, very vigilant about protecting well, knowledge, protecting the independent pursuit of knowledge. I should hope so. I mean, unfortunately, yeah. as you know, universities are are big business now too. Yeah, they and want money, they're yeah. looking for money as well. But they're so much of what they do rests on their credibility, and that if they continue to compromise this, there won't be as much cachet to their brand. Right, 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 right. Because nothing will be able to be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once it's clear, you can't actually trust anything. Yeah, that's a big problem. 
we're careening rapidly, I'm afraid, into that situation. Yes, indeed. There are ways, as you point out in the book, of creating, even if you don't have a university affiliation, to creating the look of or the appearance of credible expertise. I, I once looked into a just a statistic I found on a, a PragerU video that was about how if California passed the thing that was going to make Uber drivers employees instead of contractors, it would cost so and so million jobs. And they cited a study, and the study was by an organization called the Berkeley Research Group. And it says, oh, Berkeley Research Group study confirms that blah, blah, blah. Well, you look into it, and it turns out the Berkeley Research Group was paid by Uber to conduct this study, and they never disclosed the study. They just disclosed the underlying talking point. So essentially, this group, this shadowy group, spat out this talking point, which is then repeated in Prager University, repeated in all the ads, and then, of course, the ballot measure overturns the rules successfully. So there are all these ways in which you could establish like the manufacturer of little pseudo statistics. And I think you just highlighted another way in which we can work, you know, against this happening, which is that as someone who does journalism, right, as a lawyer, you started looking into the <laughs> veracity and into the claims and into those associations. And it would be great if journalist schools and journalists mm. as part of their mandate before they quote someone or when they quote someone, look closely at those industry ties or, w or if they quote a study. Because as you say, the more you dig in, the more you realize, oh, of course, almonds are good for you. It's funded by the almond industry. And it doesn't take that much to get to the bottom of that. And that's what's good. That's what's sort of good about, again, the U.S. is, is this broader cultural context. And we actually do require those things. Or if you contact those researchers and they don't want to say who funded them, you have every right then not to talk about the study. Mm. There are some bad incentives in journalism, though, too, because in science journalism, you want a flashy headline, like study says that, you know, eating almonds, blah, blah, blah. There are all, all sorts of websites that, and I know mm. as someone in the press, we get 50 press releases a day from people encouraging us to write about stuff and saying, we'll give you an expert who you can interview about this thing. And if you need a story, if you need to create content for your website, it's very tempting to just talk to the person who they're offering you to interview about their study. I know uh, there's this study that came out that was really depressing that used plagiarism software to look at how often the media just copy paste. And, and that's not a, a crime from press releases. But what was depressing about it is that the media copy and paste more often from, in this case, it was the fossil fuel industry press releases than from civil society groups or politicians. When we talk about a bias in the media, actually the bias is toward repeating what the industry says verbatim two times as often as any other group. So again, it's kind of reassertion of power. Mm -hmm. And there, there can also be, as you write in the playbook, kind of fake consumer activism or activist groups. There are all sorts of things that are kind of named things that make them sound like they're operating in the interests of the opposite party of the one they're actually operating in the interests of. The Center for Consumer Freedom, yes, <laughs> which is actually a, a PR front group, right? These are com sometimes called astroturf groups instead of mm. grassroots organizations. They're meant to look grassroots. And of course, AstroTurf was originally called Chemgrass and made by Monsanto. But anyway, you can get really depressed about all these things. What you're describing is the broader arsenal that the corporations use. So the last thing McDonald's wants to do is say, obesity is not a problem. McDonald's wants to say, we're cutting fat from our menu. We're going to give you exactly what you want as a consumer. And then they want to pay a trade association who will challenge obesity as a problem. Mm. So there are all these third-party groups that really do the dirty work for corporations so that they can keep their hands nice and clean. Yeah, so I think a very important thing is the playbook shows is that corporations will often make a, a very strong effort to pretend to care about solving the problem that they are in fact causing. They, I once read an article about an advertorial that I saw in the New York Times. The New York Times actually let Shell write an article, a sponsored post on the New York Times, all about how Shell was solving climate change. <laughs> oh, they do it all the time. And in the New York Times recently, they allowed JBS to take out a full page ad, the largest meat company in the world, about how they're going net zero. Mm. And you're like, how are they doing that? But again, the New York Times would say, that's our advertising section. We don't mm. police what they say. We just are here to provide space for our clients. 
that's just the propaganda department. Uh, you know, we got nothing to do with those in the news department. <laughs> yes. But maybe you shouldn't have a propaganda department. Maybe you should be, have a, be very careful. Have subscribers. Yeah, that'd be yeah. nice. You know, I've just published a book on talking points and propaganda. And it's interesting that a lot of the things I, I was that I've been thinking about in this come up in your playbook, especially in the policy section, where you talk about all these very common talking points that are applied to every policy, no matter what it is. The policy is too expensive. It wastes money. It hurts workers. It undermines rights. It hurts poor people. It costs lives. It will be ineffective. There are more important policies. The policy is arbitrary. There are unintended consequences. It threatens our national sovereignty. It's unnecessary. More research is needed. <laughs> Incredible. Just apply it to anything. <laughs> so you're seeing that as well in the sectors you work in? Those exact same arguments. Yeah. I mean, it's everything, right? You just take those talking points. Yeah. What's great about your playbook is that it's an all-purpose playbook for any issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, yeah, exactly. Any issue that involves government regulation, because fundamentally, this is a fight against any regulatory action, which, by the way, regulatory action is a stand-in for protecting the public in a democratic way. Hmm. And so it is a threat to democracy. And it's not isolated to the private sector, of course. There happens to be a political party that is anti-government in this country. It doesn't make much sense to people who don't live here, but it's something we've all grown accustomed to and speak about like they are, quote, conservatives. Not to go off. No, that's right. Because, uh, I mean, I've been writing about the right, and this is the rights arguments is always, this is going to destroy uh, civilization, this is going to hurt people or whatever. I want to ask you about one final argument that you talk about, which is, because you've also uh, co-authored a, an article about this in the context of climate change, which is the argument about human nature, which I think is a very interesting one, the way that we're often told we shouldn't do something because we are constrained by human nature. We're just not wired for it. So it's not even that we shouldn't do it. It's a very powerful argument because it isn't just that we shouldn't, it's that we literally can't. It's impossible. Yes. Now, I'm curious if you've seen uh, examples. So the, the examples I've seen of that argument being made, which is sort of an essentialist argument, right? Like we cannot do this because we were not evolved to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing that primarily come out of, of sort of well-meaning academics or journalists. And I don't see the direct tie to industry as much as I see industry amplifying those arguments. So they're very keen to use that in their messaging, but it doesn't seem to originate with the private sector, although I could be completely wrong. I'm sort of curious about those origins. But one way in which I wrote in depth about it with a co-author was about this idea that we are not evolved to solve climate change. Mm -hmm. And it's something you hear all the time, especially by sort of high-level, prestigious academics who are sort of semi-psychologists, I guess. And they want to talk about the way in which our brains are not hardwired to solve climate change. But Again, we're, we're not hardwired to do so many of the things that we do. We're not hardwired to read. We're not hardwired to scuba dive. We're not even hardwired for women's rights, frankly. Yeah. We fight for those things as a society. We've fought to end child labor. We banned horse meat. So this idea that we should be doing anything that we're, quote, evolved. I mean, yes, we breathe air. Yes, we're terrestrial animals. But this is leveraged a lot. And it's. I think it would be interesting to look at all the ways in which it's been leveraged. Yeah, we had on the program just a, a week ago, Professor Cordelia Fine, who researches uh, arguments about gender differences and, and who debunks a lot of research that says that oh, various social gender inequities are the inevitable result of the hard work, you know, these evolutionary psychology arguments, which are very, very convenient if you want to defend the status quo to say, well, human nature, the wiring of the brain, it just makes an alternative to this totally impossible, can't be done no matter how much we want to do it. <laughs> yep. I think it's a very easy defense for certain kinds of things. Gender, mm. certainly meat eating, we see that argued all the time, even though if you look at the literature, like so many of our ancestors and in prehistory, they barely ate any meat, but they say, look, we have these canines, we have to eat more meat, more meat, more meat. Yeah, it's sort of ridiculous, but it is an argument that is everywhere once you start looking for it. Yeah. As a vegetarian who is still alive after 10 years of being a vegetarian, <laughs> I can confirm there is no evolutionary imperative. There may be an evolutionary imperative to eat delicious cheeses. I haven't found a way to stop doing that. So I want to encourage our listeners and readers to pick up 
the playbook because it is very important that this book end up in the right hands rather <laughs> than the wrong hands. The wrong hands already have many, many, many copies of this book. They just aren't True. as fun to read. Yes, because my first instinct when I got it was, oh no, people are going to see this. What if they, I actually use this the, the wrong way to do these things? And I was like, no, she's exposing what they already know. <laughs> like, they already know. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But a lot of people have said that. My mother said that. I'm worried. And I said, mom, please, they have the playbook. They are the masterminds. In fact, I'm missing things, right? Mm. And I'm curious what I'm missing. And I'm sure someone, hopefully, on the edge of retirement, would, if they would want to send me the various things that I'm missing, I'd be happy to do an updated sort of epilogue with other various tactics that I'm sure deserve exposure. Mm -hmm. I just want to close here by reading a little bit from your epilogue, the appendix in which you write in your own voice. You say, in the same way that the casino could affect the character of a town, corporate-funded scientific denial has contributed to the erosion of scientific authority and mistrust in the government in the casino. And this casino, however, we are gambling with our health, the planet, and our most reliable way of knowing the world. The stakes could not get higher. I think that is so true. That is why we all have to understand the playbook, so we know how to fight the playbook. So, Professor... Jennifer Jacquet, thank you so much for joining us on Card Affairs today. Thank you so much for having me. The Current Affairs Podcast is a product of Current Affairs Magazine. If you are not subscribed to Current Affairs Magazine, visit currentaffairs.org slash subscribe today and get our glorious print edition. The Current Affairs Podcast is released regularly every week on patreon.com slash current affairs. Thanks for listening.